So I'm going to be talking about managing warfarin in primary care. So if you're unsure how to manage patients on warfarin, how to adjust their dosing, how soon to be repeating their INRs and how often to bring them in. If you panic when you get a critical INR result, either in clinic or on call, or if you wonder when to send patients to the ED, you're in the right place. That's what we're going to be talking about today. So this is NP Practice Made Simple. I'm Liz Rohr. I'm a family nurse practitioner. And these are the weekly videos to help save you time, frustration, and help you learn faster so you can take the best care of your patients. So before I get started, I wanted to let you know I made a primary care warfarin management cheat sheet. So definitely download this um, below the video so you can follow along. Also, you don't have to worry about taking any notes or anything. I've really kind of summarized the, the majority of what I'm talking about today with some other added bonuses in there, including the algorithm that I super love. It's actually two documents. So when you sign up, you'll see, you'll see, just sign up uh, and you'll get it down below. So this is Laura. I'm going to be doing a case study. This is actually a patient that I did a case study on a couple of weeks back on hypercalcemia, high calcium. If you haven't watched that yet, definitely go check it out um, after this video. But Laura is a 36-year-old female. She's a new patient, and this is not her real name or her photo. So this is a recap of kind of the background. If you've already watched this or you watched it recently, I can give you the timestamp below this video where you can kind of shift ahead. But She's here to establish care. She's a new patient to the clinic. She um, is coming from the ER as a follow-up for a DVT. This is her first one she's ever had. It was about, two, uh, about a week later from her ER visit. So she's on anoxaprine and anoxaprine bridge until therapeutic with warfarin with an INR goal of two to three. And I'm going to talk about what that means. So just stick with me for a sec. So she's a former smoker, smoking a half a pack a day, and she just stopped. Um, she's taking Queen Anne's Lay Supplement for contraception. This is her words. She... Um, it's an herbal over-the-counter supplement that people can take and unfortunately doesn't have super great traditional medicine evidence, um, but we'll kind of recap talking about that. Um, her past medical history is significant only for a therapeutic abortion a few years ago. Um, she has no known past surgical history and family history, although she's not like super sure about her family history, if there's any sort of bleeding problems, blood clots involved. She's really just can't say. So, and which I didn't mention in the last case study, but I remember that as I'm making that, making this one. So sexually active with one male partner and she's a working professional. She works at a bank uh, Monday through Friday, kind of a nine to five situation. So the plan for her Today, I'm going to be focusing on anticoagulation using primarily the, AC, the ACCP guidelines, um, which is the, actually the American College of Chest Physicians, um, uh, and also the RELY trial, which um, has, to, has like a Coumadin warfarin dosing protocol. And this is for adults only and non-pregnant adults, actually, um, and it doesn't include pediatrics, so please don't apply any of this stuff to those uh, populations. So at this visit, I checked her labs, her INR, her CBC, and her CMP. Unfortunately, I couldn't get access to the records from the hospital, and um, she only had her discharge paperwork uh, for the like the patient one, which didn't have a ton of information, and I wanted to make sure I had a baseline there. So the results, so her INR is 1.3, um, and actually in the last video, her INR was therapeutic, but for the purposes of this presentation, they're um, outside of range. So outpatient warfarin management, and this is in the handout, so don't worry about writing all this down, but um, number one, these are all the things I kind of think about when I have a patient who's on warfarin in front of me. Like, what is their INR goal? And I'll talk more about these each on the next slide. What is the length of their therapy? Um, is it three months, six months, 12 months, lifetime? Um, in-house, um, are we going to be managing her in-house or are we going to be referring out to an anticoagulation clinic? Uh, what is her follow-up plan, um, an educational plan? And then assessing signs of bleeding. I always throw this in with pretty much anybody who's on anticoagulation, just always asking in every visit or interaction that you have. So initially, when someone's first starting on warfarin, um, typically I'm getting them out of the ER or the hospital, and they've already been started on this, this regimen, and then I'm kind of inheriting them and continuing on. That's kind of the classic case that I've found, at least. So INR goals um, for the vast majority of people are between two and three. However, there are certain conditions, specifically um, um, mechanical heart valves that are two and a half to three and a half. This is very patient um, dependent and diagnosis specific. So um, you also want to determine, again, the length of therapy. So is it three months, six months, 12 months, or lifetime? And the vast majority of people are going to have a minimum of three months of anticoagulation. And the reason this is important is that a couple things. Number one, um, this, this is highly individualized. It's based on the history and the underlying conditions of the patient. And it has to do with a couple of things of whether or not the DVT was provoked or unprovoked, meaning something kind of caused it versus it happened on its own related to some underlying chronic condition or, or other blood clotting problem. 
Um, but also you want to make sure that I know that when I get, um, I inherit new patients or when I started as a new nurse practitioner, I would get patients who were on warfarin and I, I didn't automatically think like, oh, should we be continuing this? I always want you to think about that as like, that tends to happen as patients get kind of get lost in the shuffle in some ways where they are on anticoagulation longer than they need to. It doesn't happen often, but just something to keep in mind. Like if you just want to be really intentional about the patients that are going to be on lifetime anticoagulation or long-term, if it's not lifetime and then management, you want to decide, is this in-house management um, or is it in an anticoagulation clinic? And so the kind of the most important thing I think is if, even if you feel comfortable following the algorithms and, and knowing the management of warfarin, it's really important to have some sort of nurse case management support in a lot of ways because, or some sort of systematic clinic support. So the way that looks like is my clinic right now has nurse visits where patients come in person, do a rapid INR. They have a whole kind of protocol worksheet that is like signed off by a provider versus is there a nurse case manager that has a list of all the patients that need to follow up again and reaches out to them when they don't come back, things like that. Um, I don't always have the luxury of sending out to an anticoagulation clinic because of um, my patients. A lot of my patients have limited access to resources. So um, I do a lot of this myself, but I also have that system systematic support. And then initiation. So when somebody is being started on warfarin, they're usually also started on a low molecular weight heparin or heparin, um, in addition to warfarin until their INR is therapeutic. There are other anticoagulation options, but I'm really focusing on warfarin today. Um, and once they're therapeutic for 24, to four, 24 hours to two days, you can stop that low molecular weight heparin or heparin um, because, again, like – well, it takes about three days to see a change. So it's a vitamin K antagonist. So that's why you're kind of on both. And that's why you want to wait until about 24 hours to, to two days of being therapeutic to, to kind of change, to, to take that off. And I'm going to introduce the to. I just wanted to show you this picture because I'm going to be referencing what I'm talking about. Warfarin is adjusted based on dosing algorithms. And there's a number that are available. This is the one that I use that I've used for the last four years. And I find it to be extraordinarily helpful um, and very accurate. Um, and so literally what you're doing is looking at the target of whether it's two to two to three or two and a half to three and a half, um, deciding if they have any bleeding and just plugging in the number of what you get and then going from there. There's a little bit of nuance, as you can see, and I'm sorry, this picture is a little bit blurry in the in the cheat sheet down below. It's it's crisp, crystal clear, I promise. Um, and so these are uh, these are nuanced because you can have a couple of different options, but I'll kind of get into the decision making around that. So. Continuing on, so if they have, if you've, they've already been initiated, you're continuing the INR, you're going to recheck the INR every three to eight days initially, again, using those algorithm-based dosing, not before three days typically because it doesn't really change. It takes a little while to kind of catch up to any dose change. So you can talk about it in terms of the daily dose or the weekly dose. So for example, this patient is on five milligrams a day and their weekly dose is 35 milligrams in total. And so what I mean by that is that it's really based on the dose calculation that you're doing that's convenient for the, the pills that are available, the patient to take on a daily basis, and for you to kind of make sure that it's an adequate adjustment for them, right? And so I really recommend trying to keep it as simple as possible, keeping the same dose um, the same time or the same the same dose every day instead of alternating doses if you can. It, it doesn't always happen that way. Sometimes you have to to get the therapeutic level, but there's a couple different algorithms. So that one that I reference is from American Family Physician, um, American um, College of um, Chest Physicians, and the Relive Trial Protocol have different ones as well. Um, it comes on, um, and there's another note is that, it, like I said, it kind of comes in a variety of doses. So you want to think about what is the most kind of helpful for your dose that they need versus convenient for the patient, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, there's one, mil don't memorize this. You will if you do this a lot, but it's one milligram, two milligram, two and a half, three, five, seven and a half, and 10 are the typical ones that I've seen. And it's usually a combination of several. For example, the daily dose of five milligrams is great because it's a five milligram tablet. But if you need to adjust by one or a half, you have to kind of add a different dose to, to that, right? So once it's therapeutic for a week, so uh, it's, you know, the first time it's therapeutic, you check it again in a week. Uh, so it's therapeutic today at two, you check it next week and it's also two. That means that the next time you check it can be two weeks from the second one because it's been therapeutic for two weeks. And then at the end of that, if it's been four weeks in a row where it's still two, you can check it every four weeks after that until it's stable. The ACCP can, says, you can, says you can check it up to every 12 weeks if they're stable. I don't know if I feel comfortable doing that myself, but if that's that's an option available to you. So I want to talk about high INRs and low INRs. 
So again, this really depends on the number and bleeding. And so if you are um, anything like me, you like um, step-by-step, very clear, if this, then this, um, or most new grads that I've actually, I've been talking to recently have the kind of similar feeling, right? But I, this is not as maybe clear and step-by-step as you'd probably like, but I'm going to do my best. So bleeding, any bleeding with an INR that's elevated, they may or may not need to go to the ER. And this really depends, unfortunately, on kind of categories of minor and major bleeding. And this is really not super well-defined, but I've come up with a list here of, of things you want to think about. Um, so in terms of um, uh, the, the main things that I've seen when patients have bleeding with uh, warfarin uh, management is that they have hematuria. Most patients need to go to the ER with hematuria because they may need bladder irrigation depending on the clinical scenario, but this is like gross hematuria is what I'm talking about. Then you want to kind of extrapolate to what are the signs of like an internal bleed, right? So any neurologic changes, severe headache, um, intracranial bleeding, right? New abdominal pain, especially severe, um, and especially anybody who has any sort of injury or motor vehicle accident in general, they need to go to the ER if they're on anticoagulation. But um, those are all just kind of like the things to think about, you know, possibly also like some a lot of people who are on, who are on warfarin get pretty big bruises, but as long as it's not like really severe, enlarging, super painful, kind of in the context of an injury or something like that, um, and and worst case worst worst case scenario, you send them to the ER the, or you give them the alarm sign so that they can self triage, right? And then you're going to manage them according to the algorithm of your choice. And so um, this involves holding doses decreasing the total dose, and then considering whether or not to do vitamin K. Because then again, it's a vitamin K antagonist. And so if you give vitamin K back, it's going to bring that INR um, back to the back down. And then you always want to review those alarm signs for patients. And so you kind of just say the best you can, blood in your urine, severe new pain, bleeding, signs of bleeding that's not stopping, things like that. Because you know, their gums might be bleeding, but people who are not on morphine have bleeding gums, right? So you just kind of paint the clinical picture as best you can for them. So managing low INRs. So single low reading uh, in a previously therapeutic INR doesn't need bridging. Um, So what I mean by that is that when patients would would drop below their therapeutic range, they used to automatically get added back on either heparin or low molecular weight heparin. And so a, a stable INR is considered to be two or more consecutive readings that have been normal. You would, um, and the reason they've kind of changed that is that there are more risks of bleeding than there are um, benefits of avoiding um, thrombosis. So you want to consider bridging. That's what I mean by bridging is like adding that back on with the warfarin until the INR is normal or in the right range that you're looking for. Um, if it's continued to be subtherapeutic under the re- level that you want it to be for several uh, readings, or if they're a high-risk patient, which is loosely defined as having a venous thromboembolism within three months atrial fibrillation uh, with a stroke in the last three months, or a mechanical heart valve. So going back to this algorithm, we're going to reference this again, kind of going back to Laura. So for her, it's safe to do an outpatient management. Um, Whenever it's low, you always want to assess the adherence for somebody when their INR is a 1.3. And thinking again about um, medications that may interact with it and um, dietary changes. I'm sure you learned about the diet in school in terms of the warfarin and what dietary management to do for that. There's a huge laundry list of medications that can interact. And you kind of just want to always ask about over-the-counter supplements, run those kind of interaction reports um, with the medications of patients currently on and then decide if that's kind of a factor. And I talk a little bit about that in the cheat sheet as well, um, how to manage that. So um, increasing, so based on this algorithm that I that works really well for me, she's in this less than 1.5 range. And so you have the option of either increasing by 10%, 20%, or adding an extra dose. And so those options are increasing to 5.5 a day, 6 milligrams a day, plus or minus adding an extra five milligrams. And so my thought process behind that is that she's not that far from 1.5. She's not one. She's not 1.1. And I also want to choose a convenient dose for her, right? And so I'm going to actually go with the 20%, the higher dosing, because it's six milligrams, because that's only two pills, versus adding an extra dose. Like I may probably do that if she... um, was lower than that. But again, every patient is so different. It's really hard to know. So what you do is you just check it again the next week. Um, And so... um, Again, you can recheck it in a week or you, if you were being a little bit more aggressive in terms of trying to get her off the low molecular weight heparin and stay on the warfarin, you could check every four days. But again, it's kind of patient centered. Like, is she going to be able to come back that often? Things like that. And so I, I left this on here, um, the two scenarios. So this patient is currently on a low molecular weight heparin still, the enoxaprin. She, this just happened. But if this was a patient who recently had a DVT, say this was like a month from now, um, and she had her, her DVT less than three months ago, and she was already off of that bridge, she was already off of the low molecular weight heparin, the enoxaprin, 
you would consider adding that back on because she was in that threshold a period of time. And hopefully she would have had them extra low molecular weight heparins at home, the enoxaprine at home, because um, I've found unfortunately is that a lot of patients need a prior authorization for their insurance to actually get this covered. So um, it can be a challenge to get those bridged when you need them. <clears throat> and again, you always want to assess the need for duration of therapy again, because like when I was a new nurse practitioner or when I changed jobs and I inherited new patients or I, I, whenever new patients came to the clinic, I would look and see that they were on warfarin. And I think it's really easy to get sucked into a trap of like, oh, this patient's on warfarin, I'm just going to adjust them versus having really thoughtful consideration of, should I continue them? Do they need to be on lifelong? Is it three months, six months, 12 months, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So some alternate scenarios, <coughs> excuse me, Alternate scenarios here, if her INR is 1.9, you want to con continue the same dose and recheck it in a week um, because it's really not that far outside the range. And I found that most of the time they'll go back into range. <coughs> Excuse me. So her INR is 3.1. If her INR was 3.1, you want to continue that same dose again and recheck in a week because it's really just 0.1 off. So for example, if her INR was 4 though, you'd go back to that algorithm which gives you the option of holding from 0 to 1 dose. Um, decreasing by 10% and rechecking in a week, four to eight days, but about a week. And then your decision making around that is like, is she in, and I forgot to mention this, it's in the cheat sheet as well. There are certain populations that are higher risk for bleeding. And so you want to start with lower doses for them. And so that may influence your decision making about where to go. I mean, I'm trying not to make, I'm, I may be making this too complicated, but you really just kind of have to pick one choose it. Hopefully they'll come back um, on schedule as directed. And then you can just make adjustments from there and just looking at the pattern over time. Were the last three readings going up, up, up? Were they going down or were they just all over the place? You know, <clears throat> excuse me. So if the INR is more than five, you're going to assess for signs of significant bleeding, which again, like just do your best, like on the basis on the things that I told you, you're going to hold a dose decrease by 10 to 20%, rechecking in about three days. You could consider checking it sooner if you're worried about it increasing. But if you're worried somebody accidentally took a whole bunch of warfarin, they really should be evaluated in the ER, not an outpatient. And then you want to restart it when it's once the INR becomes therapeutic, considering vitamin K times one, that's the ACCP guidelines of 2.5 to 5 milligrams PO times one if their INR is greater than 10. So going back to Laura, so she's 36. She's a new patient again. She, um, I referred her to endocrine again, going back to that presentation, if you haven't watched it already, about hypercalcemia. It's so interesting. So <clears throat> um, if, if she was outside of that week um, of, of, if it was, so I left this on here, but if this was two months later after her year visit, I would restart the Lovenox because her INR was subtherapeutic and she was in that three-month window. Versus she's still continuing on it because she's only been out for about a week. So continuing Lovenox, continuing Warfarin, repeating the um, INR in four to seven days. Um, smoking cessation, again, reinforcing that. That's super important to avoid future DVTs. Um, contraception is super important, not only for just general her general life desires of not wanting to be pregnant, but also because Warfarin is a teratogen. And so that's something to really think about. And then I did a hematology referral for her because I wasn't sure if it was provoked or unprovoked, and I was really worried about her underlying possible, <clears throat> excuse me, family history. So I felt like that was important, and I just was nervous. And so I was like, you know what, someone, someone else helped me decide if this is only for three months or not, or if this was a provoked one, or if she needs more longstanding further workup, things like that. And I had her follow up with me in about a month because I wanted to make sure that her hematology appointment was all set up and she was doing well. Also, this was kind of a big change. And I just want to make sure she felt okay. And then we did just did every three months until this whole thing resolved. And then we went back to annual because she really didn't have a ton going on in terms of chronic care management. So this is, um, so that's it. Did you like this video? Um, if so, hit like and subscribe, especially if you're on YouTube um, and share with your NP friends. So together we can reach as many new grads as possible to help make their first years a little bit easier. And if you download that primary care uh, Warfarin cheat sheet below this video. You'll also get the ultimate resource guide for the new NP. Um, and you'll get these videos sent straight to your inbox every week with, um, you know, patient stories, um, extra bonus content that I really just don't share anywhere else. Thank you so much again for watching. Hang in there and I'll see you soon.